and just email me all your questions and then I'll try and put it all together and answer them all together. It might not work, no one might email me, but we'll give it a go. Let's just see, something different, innit? <laughs> Remember, a few weeks ago I said I was going to do a Q&A session and to email me all your questions and I'll try and answer them the best I can on the camera. Wow, I got a little bit overwhelmed to be honest. I had loads and loads of emails. So what I'm going to try and do is to answer those in this week's and next week's video as I'm going about my normal boaty jobs and cruising and getting on with things. So just to split it up. So I'm not just sat talking to the camera. I'm just going to answer each question a different day and and we'll see how it goes so yeah so i hope you enjoy let's crack on with the first question how long can you moor without having to move on from jasper so basically as long as you can get into the side you can stay for 14 days anywhere you want really unless there's a sign that says 48 hours or 24 hours however in winter most of those are back to 14 days anyway between october and march you can stay for 14 days and then you need to move so yeah, so that's basically the mooring and you just pay the one charge, your one license and you can just do that, which is, it's brilliant. If you do need to overstay, then you do need to notify the CRT about the reasons why and they'll often grant you an overstay. But generally just, yeah, just keep moving and, and all's good. As a continuous cruiser, how do you get around not having a fixed address for a bank account, car, doctor and mail? from Des. Just arranging my coal bag so I can see because I had a delivery today. Basically I've got no bills apart from a mobile phone and that just comes into my phone anyway, my statement. And I have my bank obviously. That goes to my mum and dad's but that's it. I've got nothing else. And then I use Amazon lockers and eBay click and collect to collect any parcels which works fantastic. So yeah and my doctors are still registered at my mum and dad's so we do need to go to the doctors and arrange to go to mum and dad's and stay over and have some family time as well so all is good but you can get round it all it's fine i don't have a car so that's probably a little bit easier for me if you have stuff you don't keep on the boat do you have storage elsewhere cheers from chris no i don't everything i own is on that boat however i do keep the odd little bits at my mum and dad's in the shed but generally no i don't have a storage unit find that if you're going to live the boat life you need to just get rid of everything how do you start that lovely trad engine of yours it looks so complicated so the next question is from wes and amy from the youtube channel boat time i'll put a link to that in the description and they've asked how do i start my engine so the first thing i do is take the chimney cap off the top that stops the rain going in and then the next thing is after climbing to my engine room or I can walk through the boat, whichever, but because I've been outside, it's climbing here, which is great. I've got some little steps. This piece of string, it's my throttle. So when I turn this pole, that turns this piece of string and it gets taut and it gives me some revs, some welly. So make sure that that's quite taut. And then key start like any other engine. <laughs> So as you can see, my engine has been converted to a key start, but I don't have a Morse control like other narrowboats. I have these two rods here. And the one on the left is my speed wheel. That gives me the amount of revs that I need to attach this piece of string. And then on the right, I have my gear. So I have forward, neutral and reverse. So it's a bit of a faff and it's not easy to go from one to the other, but it works well and I absolutely love it. So I've got the engine going now and uh, setting off today because it's an absolutely lovely day. It's winter still, really cold, but the sun's shining so it makes it a little bit warmer. And I'm heading now towards the Mac. So we're going to get on the Macclesfield today. So yeah, let's go. Now we met up with the coal boat. We've got all our supplies, which is fantastic. And we're now heading to the Mac. We're going to be on the Macclesfield today. Um, we're a good job we met up with the coal boat because there's not going to be another one down this route for ages because they're shutting a lock. So we just made that stoppage, thankfully. Ooh, it's a bit low, this one. Ooh. 
How much does a license to operate a narrowboat cost you a year? From Steve. And how much to live on a boat? From Mel with a kiss. Woohoo! So my license is £1,046. But I have a trade license. So on top of that, I have to have public liability and my insurance, obviously. So altogether, it's. Well, I did a thing last year and I added up everything including my services, I get my boat serviced twice a year, putting a little bit away for blacking and things like that which I do every two to three years. So it worked out that with all my gas, all my diesel, all my coal and all my insurances and all that sort of stuff, my outgoings was three and a half grand a year. Now I don't live frugally, I like to have my, I like to have a shower every day, instant hot water, so that uses quite a lot of gas. I've got two fires on my boat. I don't like being cold, so I have both of them lit between October and end of March. So, so yeah, so it's not that bad, is it? Three and a half grand a year. And that's also putting a bit aside for blacking and also my two services that I have every year. And also a little bit just in case anything goes wrong, because when things go wrong on boats, it's very, very expensive. one one no reversing no faffing around i did it in one now that my friends deserves a little shot <laughs> Just a quick shout out to the new patrons, Walt Duber, Paul and Kelly Hayward from Our Changing Views, Rose in the Pines and Karen Mooney. Thank you guys. Do they come by often and check that you haven't overstayed your welcome? From Mason. So you can only moor somewhere a maximum of two weeks and yes, CRT are aware of how long you've been moored because they have what's called spotters that walk along the towpath in each region, each district, every two weeks. So if you're still there when the next come round, then uh, you'll get a text saying you need to move. I've had a text. I had one uh, a couple of years ago. I only moved to the next pub and it wasn't far enough. So you do need to move to at least the next village or the next parish. If you don't do that, you can get into trouble and actually have your license revoked. So it can get serious. So yeah, make sure you do move regularly. You've just got to play the game, haven't you? You've got to abide by the rules move every two weeks and everything's fine. I mean, it's an amazing life we live, amazing freedom. So, so yeah, so I hope that answers that one. Why doesn't the CRT cut back all the overgrown bushes? Um, yes, I wish they would, but they are a charitable trust and they only have so much money and they seem to prioritize things at the moment, such as falling trees, things like that. But yeah, it's a pain because you do scrape your boat, scratches the paintwork, and it knocks everything off the top of your roofs and smacks you in the face. So yes, I wish they would too. How much of the canal network have you travelled? So I have been cruising over 10 years now. My first few years though, I was stuck just going around the Cheshire Ring due to having part-time work. Places I've been, I've done the Leeds Liverpool, which I absolutely adored. Been to Delbert Dock, been to Skipton, and all on there, absolutely beautiful. Two years ago, I did Nottingham up to Huddersfield, Narrow, Calder and Hebble, Rochdale, Hebden Bridge, all around that area. I've done the Birmingham, I've done the Langothland, Chester, four counties. Cheshire Ring seemed to be my regular cruising area. I love the Macclesfield, Peak Forest, I've done the Ashton, all around Manchester. The furthest south I've been is the North Oxford, so I do need to get down further than that. I'm um, trying to think anywhere else that I've been. Done all the whales. Uh, yeah, well, there's still more, plenty more to do, isn't there? Plenty more to do. Uh, 
So this is a very shallow stop lock and they were made for basically two reasons. The first one being to conserve water between two different canals and the second pay a toll to get onto the next canal. So yeah, so this is the little stop lock on the Macclesfield. questions from Shannon Wetherill. It said one hour stay at the water point. Is that just in the summer when there are more boats on the canal? So just to answer the water point question whilst I'm on the water point. Now for people like me that have got a massive water tank which is fantastic. Um, the good side is because I don't have to fill up that often. The downside is when I do have to fill up it can take a long time, sometimes two hours. So that's why in the summer I always, every time I pass a water point, I always just top up and then I'm only there for 20 minutes, half an hour. If I let it go empty, I could be there for a long time. So yeah, so the main thing is, is to be courteous of other users really. So in the summer, I can't hog a walk point for two hours. It's really selfish when everyone's gonna be queuing up. So just keeping it topped up. So yeah, it's just about courtesy, really. So now I've all filled up with water, Jax is leaving us. She's got a 15 minute walk back to the car and then she's going to drive to where I'm going to moor, which we're hoping to get in at, aren't we? If not, I'm going to have to send her a postcode like I normally do. <laughs> so it's just me and you now, guys. So, cheers! Just wet the lips. What are your first boating memories like and where were they? From Diana Schemp. Well, they were not on a narrow boat. When I was a kid growing up, my mum and dad, they had a little caravan in Anglesey at Charder Bay. We started off, they had a little dinghy that we used to go around the bays with, with a little outboard on it. And then he got a little boat. Not one you could sleep overnight in, but it had a little bit of a cabin, just enough to put your sandwiches in and all your spare clothes. We had some fantastic holidays when we were children there, and I loved it, I loved being on the water. And then the first time I experienced really going on a narrow boat was when I bought one and then went through a hazardous journey getting it back to Cheshire. I've always dreamed of getting a narrow boat, but you know, and people say hire it first and all that. Yes, I recommend you do do that. But also, I just went and did it. And worst comes to the worst, just sell it again. So yeah, you've got to live your dreams, try things out. Don't put loads of barriers in your way of living your dreams. Just do it. Whereabouts do you hail from? You sound just like my sister from Jim Minshall. So my accent, I'm a northerner. I'm from Cheshire, part of Cheshire, in a place called Acton Bridge, uh, near Northwich. So that your sister sounds like me, well, she's a good one. I like your sister. Do you have any plans to cruise to Long Eaton on the River Trent? We have plenty of rum from Sarah. So to answer Sarah's question, will I be going to Long Eaton? Well, I've been there, done that. I actually got trapped. Uh, the River Trent was in flood. So I was stuck there for a couple of months. I went to visit Paul Barber's boatyard, which is one of the best boatyards on the system. So if ever I needed any work doing to my boat, I would definitely be back. But I really did enjoy it. But Sarah, you always have rum on board. Well, that's my type of boater. I'm gonna keep you as a friend. People that live on narrowboats seem to be people down on their luck. I know some do it as the only option because it costs less than the flat. Oh, ex Sharon, you might be opening a can of worms here, love, but I'll try my best. From my point of view, this was a lifestyle choice. I moved heaven and earth to live this lifestyle and I worked hard to get it. And I think it's just the most amazing <laughs> lifestyle. So I wouldn't say I was down on my luck. I would say I was really lucky. It can be hard at times, but it is a lifestyle choice and what's not to love about this? I might not have much anymore, but I am free and I'm a full-time pirate. Wow, me hearties. It's gone really cold now. 
it's time to get inside so hopefully I'll get moored up around here somewhere I'm just trying to find a place to moor now for phew, it's cold it's hard work cruising in the winter I mean, my hands now I should have got my gloves on because it was quite nice and blue when I set off but now it's gone that overcast whitey freezing sky and and because I'm not moving it's cold Ooh, it's bloody freezing So this is a great little place to moor because you can park right by the canal so it'd be fantastic for Jackie and there's some boats moored there as well and no soon as I started mooring up a woman come out of a house and started kicking off Basically then I hadn't even moored up and a woman came out the house moaning about engines and saying you can't moor there if you're going to be running your engine. Well it's a canal there's going to be boats. I don't even run my engine for a long length of time anymore since I've had my lithium. We should know we don't want the boats there if you're going to run engines. I mean the canals have been here 200 odd years and uh, yeah don't go run your engine so. So I carried on till I found a nice little spot which is actually better than outside her house. So listen love, shove that up your wrongen. I'm more in here. I'm so cold. What did you do before by James? How long have you lived on your boat by John? And we would love to know your story. Why did you choose Boat Life, Steve and Justine? So my story. Well, I've lived on a boat now for just over 10 years it's my third boat my first boat was a little one it was only a little 43 footer and then i've slowly sort of upgraded and now i'm on this 57 footer and my backstory is well i used to be a teacher yes believe it or not i know i don't look old enough <laughs> um, no i used to be a teacher as a teacher for 13 years full time and then a couple of years part time after that but i just always loved to travel and i went to thailand cambodia india everywhere i've done most of europe i absolutely loved it but i did all that when i was teaching so it was in the holidays that sort of stuff and uh when i went off to thailand i went for five weeks six weeks and uh, i wanted to stay didn't want to come back and my taste of travel it all came about when i was at university in my final year i went off to africa to work i set up a little project it was at south africa and i worked around all the little townships uh doing junk percussion project with people that had nothing really, no musical instruments. So we made them. We used car wheels and drain pipes and different things, cut them all to different sizes, tuned them all up. And we made these big sculptures and played them and moved around the different townships. And I absolutely loved it. I was out there quite a while and I have been back since, but I just, it gave me my sense of travel really. It made me realize loads of things about my own life. And that was these people were so happy. They were living in a little mud hut with hardly any material possessions. And they were just so free and happy. And when I came back, as soon as I walked into my house, I felt trapped because I was in this whole thing where you have your car on finance to get to work, to pay your bills, to come home. I thought, I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to give me a job up and I'm going to go traveling. That was what I decided. So I did put the house on the market, got rid of everything I owned, and uh, I buggered off to Cambodia and Thailand for a bit. And then when I come back, I thought I do need a base, and uh, I've always loved boats. I grew up on the River Weaver, and there was loads of boats over there when I was growing up, and I used to look at them all the time. And where my house was in West Yorkshire, I was right near the Rochdale Canal, and it was beautiful there with all the narrow boats. So I thought, I'm gonna buy a boat. So I did. <laughs> I met a guy in a pub and I handed him over cash, which is not how you do it. Do not do it this way. But this was 10 years ago. And uh, yeah, the boat was a cracking little boat. And I absolutely loved it. Me and my dad brought it from Nottingham over Christmas and New Year in the winter in ice, sleet, snow, all the way back to Cheshire. Never driven a boat before. And I absolutely loved it. 
So I did get a bit of part-time work right in the beginning, doing a bit of part-time teaching. But yeah, I just it made me stuck again. I could only cruise a small circuit. But yeah, so that's my my life really. <laughs> there you go. I've now left the matrix. So guys, I'm going to leave it there for this week. I didn't want the video to be too long, so I'm going to try and finish off all the other questions next week. I had 63 emails. A lot of them were sort of duplicate questions or quite similar, but I'm hoping to finish it off next week. But before I go, I just want to say a massive thank you to this week's pirate crew. Paul and Laura, Nat Morris, Leslie Stone, Chris D from Chattanooga, Glenn from NB Bobbin, Narrowboat Bobbin, Tor Strand, Ralph Ward, John and Mal Knight, Norman Laura Vandal Handel, Janice Totham Davis, Marcia Nelson, Greg Dean, David Van Wart, Catherine Schoof, Lee and Meg, Ivan at Main Cooking Studio, Tony Brooks, Zombie Marine, Mike Turney, Stephen Brody, Ruth and Gary from Northern Ireland, and Dina Millwood. Also, a big shout out to the patrons, the silent heroes working behind the scenes. So, big thank you guys for your continued support. So, thanks very much, guys, and I'll see you all next week. Take care. <laughs>